Don't do it. Why? Well, first of all, piling up dust under the rug is no way to live. But also, in the act of refusing to, the act of saying, I'm not going to do this because it's not the right thing to do, you've made a little gain in the process of salvation. Yeah, I know, salvation is a loaded word, and I know that sweeping isn't a dire morality situation, but it's an image of a larger process. And yes, a process, not a reward or punishment that triggers through single ritual or phrase. Tonight we're going to look at gradual salvation through simple, sometimes even mundane actions, and the spiritual underpinnings that are actually pretty dramatic. How are the days of the week, setting up for a Christmas party and divine providence all connected? You gotta watch to find out. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg and Life. It's the last episode of 2016. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Curtis Childs. I'm the host, and today we're going to be looking at our day-to-day process of salvation, or the day-to-day process of our salvation, however we worded it in the title. And we're going to be doing that, like always, through the lens of the recorded experiences of Emanuel Swedenborg. And if you don't know who that is, that's cool. Nobody does. He was an 18th century scientist who suddenly went on this trip, and you can learn about it. In these two videos, here's the long version, here's the short version. Click it, educate yourself, or hang out with us here, and you'll learn a little bit about the world that he saw, which may very well be the the true nature of the world we're all living in here. If you do hang out for this show, and you find yourself confused, or you find yourself wanting to know more, get your questions in. We're going to, at the end of the show, like always, do a Q&A to the best of our ability. All right, we promised day-to-day salvation stuff, whatever that is, well, we're going to find out, and we're going to make good on our promise, and we're going to begin in part one, where we look at the six days to salvation. It's a metaphor. It's all metaphors, metaphors within metaphors. That's how we're doing it tonight, but that, you can't get away from metaphors, because they're really handy, but then Swedenborg goes and makes it more complicated by saying that actually everything is a metaphor for everything else. The things we see in the physical world around us, the way those processes work, they are reflective of these spiritual processes that are going on, which are reflective of something deeper. So it's just a language of things, and that language is going to prove really handy today. And we're first going to look at the week, you know, the days of the week. And Swedenborg says that actually the week is a metaphor for the process of salvation. And we are specifically going to be looking at this period of work and rest. And here in our modern world, I don't know about you, but we have uh, two days of the week that are a little bit special than the rest of the days because you don't have to work and you can relax and do things. We happen to be tonight right at the beginning of our work grind, right? This is Monday night, so we're moving into that phase. So you see that that dynamic in the secular world, but this actually is something that appears in faith traditions all over the place, this idea of work and then rest to cap a week. If you look at the mighty Wikipedia, which they just had their fundraiser, ah, I should have donated, I got all these emails, sorry. Um, you can see that it's not just Judeo-Christian, there's a, traditions all over the world that had this idea of a Sabbath or a rest day or rest days to cap this period of work. So why is that there? Why does it show up? And some of these traditions, you know, didn't even know that each other existed when they came up with this idea. So how does that idea spring up so much? Swedenborg says that there is underlying this phenomenon, this this spiritual reality, where this the days of work symbolize our process of salvation and regeneration, and then the rest is this state that we get to when we get through it, this peace we make with God that leads us into this heavenly state of mind. We're going to look over that with a microscope. Here's Swedenborg talking about it in his book, True Christianity, number 301. Click this. You can download that book for free as an ebook or PDF. You can read around, learn a little more about it. He says, that remember the Sabbath day in order to keep it holy. For six days you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for Jehovah your God. He's quoting from the Ten Commandments there. In the spiritual meaning, this commandment refers to our being reformed and regenerated by the Lord. The six days of labor mean battling against the flesh and its cravings and also against the evils and falsities that are in us from hell. The seventh day means our becoming connected to the Lord and our being regenerated as a result. As long as this battle continues, we have spiritual labor. But when we have been regenerated, 
we rest. And you will see it doesn't mean you rest like you stop doing stuff, but the conflict, the struggle, you rest from that and you get into this amazing uh, positively reinforced flow where life clicks and makes sense like it all, like it should. Like you kind of feel like life should be different than it is. It shouldn't be such a grind. That's where we're headed. That's where we're trying to get. One way you can get there through mental concept is the seven days of creation in the Bible. That's actually another image of this process. We did a whole show about it. If you don't believe me, click it there. But we're going to take a different look at this with a different angle and a more practical day-to-day look here. And we're not going to be using the days of creation, but we're going to be using uh, the metaphor of cleaning a house. So the process of salvation is like cleaning a house. And we wanted to use this because of this amazing coincidence that happened, where I actually, I had some security cameras set up at my apartment or house, whichever I have, I don't know. And I set them up because I was worried about someone breaking in or something. They just happened to film me, when I wasn't thinking about it, going through this very same process. As you can see here, we got this footage, and this is actually a perfect representation of the process we're all about to, that we're all going through and that we're trying to describe here. So we thought we would delve into that and see how without me cleaning up for this Christmas, uh, there's a Christmas party I was throwing. Maybe I already threw it. I don't know. <laughs> the story makes sense. But somehow that is an image of the process of salvation. And I keep saying salvation, and you're probably saying, what, what is that? What, could you please define your terms? Yes, I certainly could. Thank you for asking. Swedenborg, like he does with almost everything, he'll use words that mean one thing to most people, but he'll kind of get his own definition in there, or his own slant on it. For Swedenborg's definition of salvation is a couple of important principles we want to put out here. It's essentially the process of spiritual growth to this state of connection with God, but there's two things about it we want you to know. The first is that he says that it's a law, a spiritual law, that God is always trying to reach out to us in this process. In fact, you can see it written here. This is True Christianity 100. It is a fixed and unchangeable law that the closer we move to the Lord, the closer the Lord moves to us, toward us. So it's not like God is waiting there for us to measure up or to choose the right thing. There is this constant divine effort to reach out that actually is, God is so pressing in on us that as soon as we make any movement, he's like, okay, I'm here, I'm here, we're doing this. So that's an important part of the process. Uh, but then after that, the second one, oh, before we get to that, does that is that confusing? Um, it seems like maybe I need to illustrate this with some kind of physical object. What do we got? Oh, hey, here's something. And now this is probably the most in-depth and difficult to maneuver Ugh, studio aid we've had. Hey, look at that. Here's us, right? Here, we're going into metaphors. We're, we're piling metaphors on top of metaphors. This is us before the process of salvation. This is the process. This is us in the state of salvation, right? To complete it, this is God, or the water in here is a symbol of God's divine love and divine wisdom. So this is flowing into us, Swedenborg says all the time. And I say all the time, but I'm just doing it a little bit here. If we were really doing this accurately, there'd be hoses constantly spraying water into here. For some fairly obvious reasons, we're not doing that right now. We just picture this is always trying to come in. The problem is this one's full of junk. I mean, this one is full of non-water. You know, even if it's not terrible stuff, it's not water. It's not divine love and divine truth coming in. It's got stuff in it. The process of salvation, these little day-to-day things that we do, is just us taking something that's negatively affecting us and our life and getting it out of there, right? This is salvation. This little work, this one's a little smaller, you get it out of there. And as every single one of those that comes out allows this pitcher to have more water in it. God is always putting as much water as we can possibly handle, but through the work, we clean ourselves out. There's more space for this water to get in until eventually it's all love. It's all love. It's all wisdom. There's this, there's this union between God and us. Life clicks. Life works like it's supposed to. And this is a journey we go on from here to here. It's a journey we're going on throughout our lives. And if you feel like, man, I've been lifting these wood chips out all day, you're not alone. Everybody has to go through this process. This is Secrets of Heaven 10360. Pretend I'm not on screen because I got to take this thing off here. Okay. All who come into heaven must first engage in conflicts against evils and falsities of evil. So everybody has to go through these conflicts. And when these have been separated, those people enter heaven and are joined to the Lord. And then they have rest. The like applies to people in the world. It is well known that they must engage in conflicts or undergo temptations before they become the church. 
that is, before goodness and truth which constitute the church have been implanted in them. Thus, before they have been joined to the Lord, consequently, before they have rest. So there you have, again, this Swedenborg defining a word in what I would call a special way, because he talks about church, and if you think about church, you think about a building or something. But he's saying the church is something inside you when good and truth, love and wisdom come together. That's the church, and that's the state of rest that we're looking for. And you may be wondering, uh, how do you get divine love and wisdom to stick in you like that. If God's always trying to bring them in, what's the mechanism by which you allow them to be received? Well, it has to do with this principle here, our second principle. We have God's love and wisdom in us as though it is ours. That's how Swedenborg often describes it. Love and wisdom come out of God. God is the infinite source of all that stuff. And we feel that in us, and it feels like it's ours independently, but it's actually this gift and this connection from God. And it's important for that feeling to be there because we have to to make those things a part of us. We have to feel them and act on them as if they were ours alone, meaning I fully take responsibility for this. I fully want to move on it. Doing it in a state of autonomy and freedom, that's what makes it a part of us. And that's what we've got to do. Uh, If you're like, how would you say something like this in your day-to-day life? Well, uh, we could put it like this. There's a second, uh, lower third that's going to pop up. Yeah, you need to get started, then the Lord starts flowing. You might think of the pitcher pouring as something relatively passive, but we actually have to make the first move. God is pressing in, but we have to take initiative. And we're going to see exactly how that looks and how it works in the real world, the fake real world, in the next section. So let's take a look. Yeah, daily grind. The salvation, you might think of salvation as something that would appear on a big timeline of your life, like right there, that was salvation. But Swedenborg says salvation is happening day to day as we work along. And what makes up that daily grind of salvation? Well, it's acts of repentance, of course. And you're probably saying, so what's that? You're just swapping term for term. All right, I'll give you a straight definition, and I think a very good definition of what an act of repentance is. This is True Christianity 510. <clears throat> Acts of imp- repentance include any and all actions that result in our not willing and consequently not doing evil things that are sins against God. So there's a lot of terminology, sins, God, evil, you, but we all know what that is, meaning things that are harmful, intentionally harmful. That's another way that you could put it, right? That, anything that makes us not do that stuff, that's an act of repentance. Uh, it may be self-evident, but the, the child in me wants to ask why. So you have that. Why is it so important to get that stuff out of you anyway? Why, why not do bad things? Why can't divine power just kind of circumnavigate that and give us this salvation anyway? Uh, the answer, divine providence 100, according to Swedenborg. On the basis of reason alone, everyone can see that the Lord, who is goodness itself and truth itself, cannot enter us unless what is evil and false in us has been banished. What is evil is the opposite of what is good, and what is false is the opposite of what is true. And there is no way that opposites can mingle. No. When one approaches the other, there is a battle that lasts until one gives way to the other. Then the one that gives way moves off, and the other takes its place. Back when I had this, you might, this is like such a peaceful coexistence. Yeah, the sticks are in the way, but then Swedenborg is saying that the actual nature of the stuff that's in the way of God, it explodes when God gets near. You know, there's, there's such a reaction, the two repel each other because they're opposites. They're, they're, they're mutual love and the opposite of mutual love, right? So we got to get that stuff out of there if we want to be able to accept this. So we do that through these little choosings, or to, to not do bad stuff, right? And we're going to show this because, again, I said it was caught on camera it, through this process of me cleaning up for my Christmas party. Now, the, the rest of the show is going to be built on this, this footage of me doing this stuff. And it's a silly example in some ways because it's me cleaning my house. And cleaning house is not a moral fulcrum. You know, this is not life or death on a spiritual level. However, it is an example in its own right meaning it is an example of orderly behavior and of trying to get past the negative stuff in me that's keeping me from this connection with God. But also, it's, a, it's again, a metaphor or a correspondence, because I'm going to be cleaning up things in a house, but, but the house of the mind 
can be cleaned as well. And what what dirty laundry is laying around in the way that we talk to people, in the way that we think about people, in the way that we act towards people, what do we need to clean up there? That's what we're going to be looking at. And where we're going to join me in this security camera footage that was amazingly captured, I have multiple cameras around that sync up, it's really kind of cool, uh, is that I was trying to clean my house up. I knew this party was coming, but I just couldn't get started. You know, there's so much to do, and I just didn't know how to get that initial inertia. But I'd heard that principle we ended this section with, which was, you know, I'll get started, then God will move with me. And you'll see how that changed the whole thing. So here's the first clip. I step forward and God moves with me. Ah, you thought the montage would be enough. You see someone montaging, he's got to have cleaned up all the clothes. Nope, there was so much mess there that I just barely made a dent in it. And isn't that sometimes the way it is? Once we start to try to make positive changes, you just see, oh, there's so much going on. So whatever your dirty laundry is, whatever habits are just cluttering up your ability to live, whatever negative thoughts or tendencies, it can seem like I tried to get rid of some of them, but there's so many. However, it is a start. Don't get discouraged because don't get discouraged because it is a start. And to get that start, I was using this principle that it's not just I've got to do it. God is seeking to come into that situation, bring divine order into it. But until I get up off the couch and put my first effort forward, we can't work together. So there, that was the first little bit. So that's that's in cleaning up actions, right? So I was changing what I was doing externally, but we also have to look at our motivation for things. This is from New Jerusalem 164. If we are practicing self-examination in order to repent, it is important that we examine our thoughts and the intentions of our will, and note what we would do if we could get away with it. That is, if we had no fear of the law or of losing our reputation, our job, or our wealth. Our evils live in our will. That is the source of all the evil things we do physically. Therefore, if we do not search out evils in our thoughts and our will, we will be unable to repent, because afterward we will have the same thoughts and intentions as we had before, and intending evils is the same as doing them. This, therefore, is what self-examination entails. And, if you can possibly believe it, we actually captured some footage of me doing this very process, examining what was in my will and, and making a choice based on higher principles. So you're going to see here where, where I faced my temptation to kind of manipulate my way out of the situation. had a lot of important stuff to do today, but I guess if you're sick. Oh, I missed my dentist appointment, and there was so much else I had to do. So in there, I delved into and examined the contents of my will. I'm, you know, I started to clean in the first clip. There's still a lot to do. I know the party's approaching. I didn't want to really do it. And I thought, hey, man, why don't I just lie? Why don't I just call my brother, my poor, innocent brother, and lie and say I was sick and try to play on his good nature to get him to do the work for me, right? So I saw, hey, that's in there. My desire to, to not have to exert myself is quite strong. And it would be willing to put somebody second to get its aims, oops, excuse me, to get its aims accomplished. However, in there, you notice there was a moment when I was, I'd already made the call, but I hung up before he answered. Uh, I guess he'll get a missed call on his end. Uh, but I didn't do it. I didn't go through with it because I saw in my mind's eye the potential consequences of that for him, and I made a choice there. So that's pretty good. That's that will, will give me a plus one point there. And we have in those two first clips. This is an example. You have the cleaning up of the actions, or the exterior thing, and then the cleaning up of the will, or the examination of my motives, and what, and specifically also 
what I would do if I could. Because you want to change your behavior, but also change the kinds of things you dwell on. The kind of all of these can stand in the way of. Remember where we're getting. I'm not just trying to lecture you. We're getting to like this is this is happiness. This is life going like it should. This is the human race getting along with each other, and it is worth this kind of work that we're talking about here. All right. So that's where this whole thing is going, and those are the steps. So whatever the steps are, they're good and they're worth doing. As we have this sort of dynamic of the the actions, and then examining the inner contents of the person. So now that we have that, we're going to look at how this played out in in some more of the tasks I had to do to get ready for this party. And here we're going to look at a specific example of, of both of these popping up in what may seem like a simple activity. So here's clip three. When we are considering doing something evil and are forming an intention to do it, we say to ourselves, I am thinking about this and I am intending to do it, but because it is a sin, I am not going to do it. This counteracts the enticement that hell is injecting into us and keeps it from making further inroads. I want to do this, but it's not good, so I'm not going to do it. I was going to get the dustpan. We realized after we found that clip that it sort of just looks like I'm just walking away. Like, I don't even want to mess with this because I, I, I know I'll be evil about it. It's a silly example, sweeping dust under the rug. Uh, however, it illustrates a principle which is profoundly serious, which is us taking shortcuts that can harm other people, but doing it. It's also us indulging uh, things that put our needs ahead of other people's needs. It's also us outright trying to control other people, dominate them, get our way with the world. Uh, so these are the kinds of things we need to apply that principle that Swedenborg is talking about. And any time, and we got a million opportunities a day to just say, I'm thinking about doing this, but it's not good, and that's why I'm not going to do it. Not because, oh, I'll get caught or something like that, but just, this isn't good. So you're probably already doing this, but we're getting intentional about it, and we're doing it because and knowing it's part of this larger framework gives it extra power there, All right? So what, if you do start to do this, or maybe you already started, you'll notice that if you start to try to look at what's going on with you, you'll, you'll backslide at times. You'll feel like, oh, I was making a bunch of progress. I was choosing the right thing. She's, oh, I messed up this. Or, oh, I didn't realize exactly how difficult it was going to be not be, be angry when this thing happens, right? That is very tough to do, and that's fine. This is actually, it's actually normal to have this kind of regret when you're going through the process. It's just how it is, and we actually, believe it or not, have footage of that happening right here where uh, a habit from my past, and you'll see just how serious it is, comes back to haunt me. When we are living in kindness and faith, we regret our faults every day. We think about our bad traits, admit them, avoid acting on them, and ask the Lord for help. It's all right. Nobody's perfect. This is part of a process, and I am going to get through it. He says, when you're in charity, yeah, you're going to have some regrets. Not not uh, people who aren't cool have regrets. Everybody does, and that's fine. It's actually a good sign because as we initially, the state we all kind of start in is whatever's mine I think is cool. If I did something bad, that's fine. It was a good reason for me to do it. What we eventually we get to is where we just see truly if this thing was, was harmful, I don't want it to happen, even if it's something that I did. So that's that's a good step. And of course, with, as with any self-examination, you don't want to fall too far into like beating yourself up about it. That's not the way heaven works. Swedenborg says that's actually the way hell works, is to try to get people 
discouraged about their own morality. The process works if you're just putting in effort. Because remember, the divine is working with us. Everybody has that potential. It's just good to know, hey, this is this is something you can expect, and that's just fine, even if you've done something as terrible as that, that thing you saw me do. Um, and if you're listening to the podcast, you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about. Sorry, man. Um, now, there's a positive side to it. Too. Okay, fine. I was stuffing chip, ba- chip bags into the couch instead of the trash can because the couch was closer. So there's also a positive side to the whole thing, which is that when something good comes along, so when something bad comes up, we admit it and we face it, but we don't get too discouraged. But when something good comes along, we amplify that. We grab onto it and really get hyped about it. And you're going to see that happen here for me as I finally finished this cleaning odyssey I was going on and got ready to decorate for this Christmas party. And you're going to see me grab on and celebrate things. And you'll see some pretty amazing celebrations coming out of me. And then it's going to all end with that party we've been amping up to. So here's the fifth clip. Any argument supporting a charitable affection is something we seize, hold on to, and protect, and we use it to strengthen the goodness and truth inside us. Hey, you know what? This is actually going to be a great place to have a party. That's that party. That's that rest. It's You see, all that work was not just for life to end. The state of rest is not you lie down and go to sleep, nothing happens. That's The state of rest is where the real life begins. Because I'd taken the time to clear that space out, now this good can happen in there. Now you can invite your co-workers over to, to a party at your house. You can connect and talk and change and live. That's the kind of thing we're working towards. We're just getting our space ready for the real stuff to happen. It's not that the seventh day or the rest is the end. It's really, it's the beginning, all right? So to wrap up, the process really works. Like, if you see, you got to get started. If you see a mess around you, it may seem impossible, but just get started knowing that God is in it with you. You have an infinite source of power that's urging you to just let let him help you a little bit. So that and we have to take the first step on our own. That's just a part of it. We have to get in there, we have to change the actions. You have to examine what's going on in here and not just what am I thinking and feeling? What what do I really care about? What would I do if I could? You just really get in there. It's just you. It's just you and God in there, whatever. It doesn't have to be this kind of judgmental thing. It can be an exciting thing because once you identified oh, here's where the wood chips are, then you can grab them out. Then you can get them. And that's exciting because then you can get this whole cleaning thing done. So you do that, you combine them. Uh, you, When something comes up that is less than helpful to the human race, I'm not going to do it because it's not good. That works. You celebrate the good things. You don't get too down about the bad things. And in the end, we have this connection, this state with God where the peace and the rest come into play. So that's cool. And that all happened over the course of this little cleaning session that I was doing. However, the spiritual underpinning, the dynamic behind that was much, much more dramatic than will I sweep this pile under the carpet or not. And we're actually going to be able to take a look at what was happening spiritually because your tax dollars at work. The Swedenborg Foundation Labs were able to come up with a video filter that lets you see into the spiritual world. Yeah, that's true. It lets you see what's going on with angels and with hell, and how are they clashing over this kind of stuff. So we have this technology. The problem is I don't know how to read the results, but I'm going to bring in a friend and colleague who does know how to read the machine, and together we're going to look at what was the spiritual reasons for why I did what I did, cleaning up for that party. All right, let's take a look. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, here's our expert uh, reader. Who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? I have no ah, oh. Dr. Jonathan Rose. Oh, you look me. Yeah, man, you look great. I think we're in the same like neighborhood on the color wheel. <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna. So we we spent all this money developing this technology, and I really am excited to use it. I appreciate you coming in on short notice again. Um, but but I don't know. I don't understand. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, will you help me figure myself out? Um, and actually. To to look at the underlying dynamics, Swedenborg describes initially what's going on here, what we're going to be seeing in Secrets of Heaven. Would you read a, a quote that, that we brought? Sure. Let's look at Secrets of Heaven 8403. All it's right. a fairly long quotation. But okay, it, wait. Let me just get comfortable. tells you some of what's going on behind the scenes. Okay. Here. People who have not been taught about human rebirth, imagine we can be reborn without being tested. Some suppose we can become reborn after undergoing a single crisis. It needs to be known, though, that no one is reborn without trials and that the trials come one after another in great numbers. The reason is that rebirth takes place in order to kill off the life of the old self and instill new heavenly life. Struggle, then, is clearly inevitable. The life mm. of the old self resists, not wanting to be snuffed out, and the life of the new self can enter only where the life of the old self has been snuffed out. So it's plain that both sides fight, and fight hard, since they're fighting for their life. Wow. From this, anyone who uses enlightened reason to think about it can see and perceive that we cannot be reborn without struggle, or in other words, without spiritual trial. And the quotation goes on. Such a person can also see that it takes not just one trial, but many to regenerate us. Right. After all, there are a great many different kinds of evil that made up the pleasure of our previous life or constituted our old life. These varieties of evil cannot all be conquered at one and the same time. They hang on tenaciously because they took root in our forebears for many ages back, ah, heredity. are therefore born into us and are reinforced by the evil we have actually committed on our own since childhood. All this evil is diametrically opposed to the heavenly goodness that needs to be instilled in us and to become the substance of our new life. So that sounds pretty dramatic. Yeah. But that's something that you that we may be looking for in okay. in this security uh, camera footage. Well, if it's something we're all going through, you know, it's dramatic, but it's got to be something we can metabolize because we're all doing it anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Before we do that, I want to say two things. Did I ever introduce who you were? This is Dr. Sure. Jonathan Rose, series editor of the New Century Edition, translations of the theological evening, works everybody. of Emanuel Swedenborg. These <laughs> these translations we've been seeing up there, um, that's him heading up that crew. The other thing is that I've been tr subtly trying to get our visual aid out of the picture here. <laughs> mm, yeah, okay, money's worth. All right, so let's take a look now. If, if that dynamic is going on in this seemingly silly stuff that I was doing, let's see how it occurs and where it occurs. So here's, let's put the yeah. filter on this footage here. Um, so this is me in my house, you know, really uh, not having this with a task ahead of me. Mm. Okay. So what's that? Okay. Is that good or bad? I think I can see what that is. This is actually quite normal. It may okay. look alarming. Yeah. <laughs> but what you've got here is you've got three evil spirits on the left. You've got three angels on the right. Mm. Okay. And you're being influenced by both of those at the same time. You think you're by yourself. Sure. This was quite a shock to Swedenborg when his spiritual eyes were open because yeah. he thought he was just having his own thoughts, doing his own thing. He's right. alone. Right. But actually, there are these other forces that are with you, even while you're, you're not aware of them. You don't know they're there. Right. But they are acting upon you. So it's, it's really, and it all of heaven and all of hell pressing in against us all the time. Right. That's right. And yeah. we're in, part of what's interesting about this is that we're in an equilibrium between these different forces. That's why there's the same number represented there. Sure. And so you can move one way or the other. And there's this principle that Swedenborg calls the as of self, which means that you need to act, you know, in your, 
on your own behalf, you know, to make a choice. Yeah. Like right, these right, two right. things, okay. it's just like air pressure pushing equally on either side. Yes. So you can move to the right or to the left. You can lean to it. Let's watch me situation. do that. So let's see, where do I lean here? Um, so that's going on. It just looks like I'm sitting in my room. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to clean. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a good, you know, the thought is coming from the angel side or yep. something. You're thinking, I'm going to clean. So let's see. How yeah. So they're pushing us out. into constructive behavior. All right, and then when I actually go to do it, what's, oh, what's that? That mm. doesn't look good. No, no, that, that's, that is a striking phenomenon. I've seen, I have seen that before. Okay. Um, you mean this in, is, in everybody? <laughs> this, in everybody. <laughs> yeah. This is a battle that's going on that actually start, kicks up to the next level okay. as you start to become active. So right. evil spirits want to stop you or redirect you or deflect you from your goal. Angels yes. want to support you, protect you, you know. And so that cloud that you see around your head there is actually this, you know, spiritual intensity that's developed as you got off the couch and okay. started to do okay. something. And we're using this silly example here, but in when you're more seriously really taking your life and, and going in a positive direction, heaven is trying to encourage you. Hell's trying to cut you down. And that's right, right. And, and, a, and a battle ensues. Yep. So, all right, we know the nature of the battle. Let's look at how the, how does this play out for me when I'm doing a specific task. Mm, you okay. Know? So let's, uh, you know, did you see, were you watching the show earlier? I, I did yeah. this thing where I was sweeping. Let, let's yeah. take a look at, yeah, let's have a at look how at that. that goes. All okay, right. there's a sweeping. So that just looks pretty normal to me, but put this filter oh. on. Okay, what, what, what is this all about? Mm, look at that. On the left-hand side, the evil spirits are saying, isn't this the worst? There's so many better things you could be doing. I, you okay, know, that's, so you, that's one that gets me a lot. That's you just know? like, you hear that in your thoughts. I mean, oh, they, yeah, yeah, that's okay. in your thoughts. You're not hearing it out loud. Right. Uh, it's just in your, but it's floating through your thoughts. And then other thoughts are going through. So isn't it worth it to do it well? You know, it's funny how sometimes your thoughts will answer other thoughts. That's you right. know what I mean? You'll hear that's something right. on one side, and then you hear another thing on the other side. And we're mostly unaware that these are different spiritual influences that are that are affecting us. And that other one says on the right there, it's so satisfying to know there's nothing to hide. Ah. You know, that's a more positive thing. Yeah, I see constructive goals on the right and just kind of swipes on the yeah, left. Yeah, that's right. All right. Negativity. That's yep, right. Yep, yep. All right. But then as I'm moving on... You know, here's the moment of truth. Mm. I'm making a decision here, right? But I'm alone for that, right? Oh, and then you pause. Ah. That's so amazing. Now, one of the things that's really interesting and kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It came up in one of those earlier quotes is that when... So, you're... If I analyze the tapes correctly... Yeah, I think you if are. I, if I have my glasses sure. on the right way up as I look at this tape, I think what's going on is, A, they're influencing you to just take the shortcut, sweep it under the rug, who right. knows, nobody right. sees, who cares, That's you right. know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you think yet, they would encourage me, right, once I started to do right. it. Right, and yet, when you're doing that, they're hassling you yeah, about no. doing what they suggested you do. Yeah, yeah. So they're saying, oh, always cut in corners, you're so lazy, this is how you always... Well, are. they have a good point. So, so they're, they're they, yes, and there's, there's sort of pseudo-truths that they yeah, use, yeah, but yeah. the process is that they're gotten on your case about something that was their idea in yep. the first place. And the angels are, are there and and wishing to modify, you know, yeah, and, and I have heard break that cycle. Swedenborg does say that, that hell, what they love to do is push people into evil and then condemn them for That's that right. evil. But but the angels, are they like you'd, you'd expect? Maybe they are saying to me, you're, you're weak, you gave in, you don't belong here with us in heaven. But let's see what, they, what they're saying uh, once I make this choice. I decide... I'm not going to do it, and... Okay, so that's what that head shake was. You're saying, no, no. I, yeah, I'm, well, I remember I'm this. Not, I remember feeling right, like, right. I just suddenly got this sense of like, wait, 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 this is, I, I can do better than this. So so how are they playing into that there? Now, see, they are very excited because there's a certain thing. They can only help you so much, but we have to, you know, what do they say in that quote? Right. We have to make the first move. Yep. And so they're so excited. You know, it may seem to you, like, to you, it's just a, a private moment. Do I sweep it, do it not? And you don't get any credit for yep. not doing it. You don't Except get any it, harm it, for doing it. it ended up on the internet. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but normally. Yeah, right, yeah right, but right. normally that would just be That's a private. Right. That's right. Other, other than those security cameras, that would be a private yeah. moment. And But when you make that decision, you know, there's this great rejoicing that goes on mm -hmm. on the heavenly mm -hmm. side because they're saying, yay, get back, evil, you know, yep. and that you've made a choice 
and you've moved in a heavenward direction with that simple little choice. That's right. You moved in a heavenward direction, and they're reinforcing that. Enough to, to change the equilibrium. so that Because it's not like there's more hell or more heaven there now, but my choice tipped the balance somehow. Right? Yes, and they're upset, and they're going back and saying, oh, man, and they're grumbling. Part of the thing is that for the evil spirit, I mean, these are real people. It may sound sure. weird, and, and we're having a lot of fun with this, but, yeah. but they sort of can read whether they have hope in you caving to what okay. they're suggesting Whether they can not. flip me. Right? And when you go a certain way, it's like, oh, you know. Yeah, right. Ah, it's, it's painful to them because they, they don't want to be in that situation mm. uh, and push back and everything. All right. So that's a great moment. So there. this, yeah, and so as you made a great point, which is that we're like describing this really bizarre, intense phenomenon in a silly way, but we're trying to, you know, get the concept down easy. Well, let's, if you, if, if that's not working for you guys at home, let's go right to Swedenborg to hear like, okay. here's the nitty gritty, because he saw these battles unfolding and, and the drama in them. So would you, would you yeah, read yeah, the next one? Yeah, sure. Here's Secrets of Heaven 741. The tests, that's what we just saw, the yeah. tests that we undergo are nothing else than battles between the evil spirits and angels who are present with us. The evil spirits, I think this is amazing, okay. summon up every wrong that we have ever done or even considered yeah. from childhood on. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've experienced that in this stuff. I've experienced it. It's amazing what they can drag up. Yeah. You know, something from 30 years ago. Oh, I'm sure people that have evil would, would feel like that. So. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> if you happen to be one of those right, unfortunates. Right. So they stir up both what is evil and what is false in us and condemn us for it. That, that's what we were talking about earlier. Yep. Nothing gratifies them more. It's the central pleasure of their lives. So when they're doing that, accusing, yeah. they're 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 living high on the hog. You know, they're it's, really enjoying. It's that. just bullying. It's just a bullying tactic. You know, yeah. we're going to set you up and then we're going to knock you down. And, yeah. and even if you're like, oh, I don't know if spirits do that, but it happens in your mind. I mean, you can. Yeah. Everybody knows that. That's everybody how your own knows thoughts that goes are. on in right, your right, mind. Right. That's right. And and part of what separates the evil spirits from the angels is that the evil spirits don't care about whether this is good for you or not. That's right. You know, they would actually like you to be serving them or whatever. Yeah. But the angels actually care about how you're doing. Okay. Okay. And let's hear about them here. But through the angels, the Lord protects us and prevents evil spirits and demons from pushing beyond the furthest limits of our endurance and drowning us. You see, there's an interesting point in there that there's a limit to what's useful about it. You know, right. and so it will be allowed to that point where it can purify mm. you or you know, you you get to make a decision and so on. But if it was just an inundation and it was just gonna crush your right. soul, there's no point in that. And no. so that's protected from going that and, far. And hell would go that far. Hell just wants yes. to destroy. It doesn't even know that it's playing a part in a larger process, but divine providence is managing things. And I think we'll see that a little bit. Yeah, that's right. And and another important facet is how you react. Here's another quote okay. from Secrets of Heaven 653. Great segue. We must combat falsities. The emphasis on we. You know, mm -hmm. we must, you know, you think, well, why, why not just get the angels to do that? Sure. That we must combat falsities when we're going through times of trial. Although it is the Lord working through the angels connected to us who actually fights against them. This is a very important principle mm. that uh, really only divine power is strong enough to combat what we're fighting. And yet the, the, the paradox is that if we do nothing, they can't help us. You know, it, right. we've got to siphon it in. And yet it's really, the, the, you know, it's really those forces from heaven that get the job done. Well, and that, we just have to get it started. That goes right back to the beginning of the show when we we're saying that we have divine love and wisdom inside us as though it were our own. That's right. right. So that we think, yeah, I can't push back some kind of force of that magnitude. But it's actually as soon as we make the effort, that is the power of God. Mm in there, or the divine power in there. And that's how you, you come to, to the fight with the right weaponry. That's right. That's right. And that really leads to our, our next point, I think, which is about the um, divine presence. Okay. Right? Yep. Yeah, let's, let's take a look. We have a little more footage here uh, where we explain a, a couple Good. more things that I go great, through. Great. Let's see what we got here. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. This, mo this moment of decision. This is like... All right. So you, if you remember, if you saw earlier in the show, here's where I'm thinking of getting uh, my brother, my, my wonderful, lovely brother, to come and do what I don't want to do, <laughs> and manipulating him and kind of disrupting his life. So 
I have and, the phone and, up. And yeah. lying to him. Because oh, Because yeah. if you just said, I want you to clean my floor, he'd say, clean your own floor. No, you know? yeah. That's a, <laughs> but if you're pathetic. He, and, he'd you know, say it in other terms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, okay, what, what's going on here? All right. Well, here you got forces of evil again on on the left hand side, and and the forces of good on the right, and the evil saying, "Yeah, get someone else to do it." You know, so that idea. Yeah. You may think it's just sort of an impulse of like, well, it's just problem solving. You know, that's I think right. I'll get the. You know, that's right. But no, that's actually coming in from hell. And then I remember where you you had that thought. I think think we'll see some more of that footage in a moment. But where you think, no, that would be unkind. You know. So there you go. Yes. No, I'm not doing it. That's it. You know, that's, that's it. magnificent. Oh, and they like it. And what heaven is doing, yay, go, Curtis, you're not getting them this time. They say to the evil spirits, because there's a battle between those two. As far that's as right. they're concerned, the forces of darkness and the forces of light, they're they're seeing it as about each other, yeah. largely. You know. Yeah, and this, again, silly example, but there is that is kind of a microcosm of the nature of evil in that I want to use him to get my way. I want to have dominion over his life. Yes, right. So that's, that, right. that's a silly example, but that's kind of the root of all evil. Mm, touches that's the true. root of all evil. That's true. Getting him to be your servant, manipulating mm -hmm. him, getting him to, to do the dirty work. Like, I, I know what I want. Everybody else exists to get me what I want. Yeah, that's yeah. bad. That's bad. I really yeah, got bad. some. I, you know what? I can't believe I had that failure. Um, that's making now, me feel really bad. Um, if only we had some footage related I, I, to that. I, well, I know that it gets discouraging yeah. when you have that feeling of failure, but but Swedenborg actually says that the feeling of failure can be an important part of the process. Mm. And as you were saying earlier, beating yourself up, you know, that doesn't help. That doesn't do anything particularly, but, yeah. but it just makes it slightly worse. But that feeling of despair, do we have that footage there? Yeah, let's let's take a look at it. Uh, oh, that, this dude, I don't even were, like to watch this. Because you were digging in the. Yeah, it reminds right. me of it's just, just like, like how wow, bad. how you know how bad can it be? So what's that? I got well, this like that football. Is, that is interesting. There's there's sort of an egg of light around you. Now, so at that moment, what I imagine you were going through is that you're really feeling like I can't believe myself. Yeah. You know. Yes. Did I really? Did I really do that? Yeah. You know? If I did, and you're I thinking mean, about it, you really did it, and so you feel like I don't. I project that what you're thinking at that point is, I will never be different. Like, well, I, just, I will not go. Yeah. I, I'm a project. There's no reclamation on it. Like, how are yeah. you going to fix somebody that, that yeah, did yeah. that? Yeah, right? yeah. This is so, so hopeless. Yeah. But that white shield that's around you there is actually a positive force that's protecting you and that's getting usefulness out of that experience because that feeling of despair and failure is actually a spiritual moment where you can move forward. When you get that sort of objectivity for a second, you mm. go, whoa, this is not, you know, this is hopeless, you yeah. know. And it's not hopeless. That's not true, nope. what you're thinking. But it is that something needs to change. And that, yeah. again, siphons good things in. So you see you're surrounded by good things that yeah. are coming in, even though at that very moment you feel like something's absent. And that gets to the point I started to talk about before, sure. about divine presence. Yeah, and that there's that actually, in the darkest of times that God is more present yeah. than, than before. Yeah, and that's what that's what people say, and Swedenborg really echoes that. Here's Secrets of Heaven 840 that talks about this. As long as our trials continue, we think the Lord is absent. It's right. interesting, it says as long as they go, you know, as so long as they go Throughout on, the process, right? We think the Lord is absent. Since evil demons disturb us, sometimes to the point where despair almost prevents us from believing God exists at all. It's good that he acknowledges that, you know, that, that people go... That's you, cool. It's not like you're always like, ah, the, the struggle is, you know, am I going to impress God or not? There plenty of people are often just like, what are you talking about God? Like, this thing just happened, you know, it, so... He, right. he realizes that that's gets the right condition. To, to right that point. Even if you've been a believer exactly. of some kind or whatever, yep. you get to the point where you say, I don't even think there is, you know, this yeah. is so pointless. Yep. But, Swedenborg says, the Lord is closer then than we can possibly believe. Hmm. When the trouble ends, we find comfort. Right. And then we first believe the Lord is present. So interestingly, that process gives us an enhanced awareness yeah where we start to be able to sense in a different way that the lord is present yep. we, we he was more present than we could possibly believe but we're just going through our drama and never, you know you know we're, yeah. we're not aware of that presence in the same and way through that through that experience and through feeling that despair and that humbling and and then actually feeling god come in you get this like a tangible sense like oh this is real 
Yeah. This is not theoretical. This is real. All yeah, right. So that's right. And, and we actually, uh, you know, we had that extra grant and we did put sink enough money into the technology that mm. we, we actually have a level in which you can see the divine through our video filters. Oh, so do you want to wow. see? And yeah, we yeah. found something very interesting when we looked over. This is actually all those previous clips we saw with this extra layer of filtering really? on. With that it's, presence in there. You can actually see the Lord is there. And we're going to oh, see if we can find cool. the Lord in every shot yeah, here. Okay. So let's just initially, see uh, let's take a look at our at our footage here. Okay. There's me. Look. Oh yeah. So there's even a spiritual behind, overlay. You could just see it for a second. Oh. There's like a Whoa, figure. That's you can subtle. But there's like something. a whiteness. Uh, there's yeah. a there's a light back behind there. there. When I'm trying okay. to do this thing from yes, yeah, so you can see oh, yeah. that even behind the dynamic of heaven and hell, there is this divine presence that's o- almost overseeing it. It's not yeah, just you a can balanced see force arms out there. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you've got the balance of good and evil, but there's also this overarching force that's managing yeah. the whole process it's, and very present. Oh, there it's quite clear in that one. Isn't yeah. It? So, so it's not like cool. There's sort of heaven and hell. And that's it. There's two equal forces working against each other. Behind it all, managing it all, is God and is divine providence. And I like the fact that there it's very present in the party, like you're more conscious of it. That's right. Now, uh, but it's very present when when things really get get going and get to be fun. It was there all the time, but in these in the more the ones where I'm in greater conflict, it was harder to pick out the silhouette. So that's that's pretty good uh, technology there, man. That's cool. So we've seen this process that I went through, uh, and we've seen the spiritual side of it all the way up to the party. But Mm. what's the spiritual significance of the party? going to take a look at that in the next section thanks so much for coming on the mm, program good fun hope to have you back again great all right we'll go to the thanks next scene Yeah, so what is the party? What What is that? What is the underlying spiritual essence of that? So this process that we saw me go through here, this is both accomplished in little teeny bites and over the course of our entire life, meaning it, it, in, in micro format, we go through these little processes, little versions of this process, the work and then the rest all the time over all these little things, all these little connections that we make. And then our entire life is this process as well. This is Secrets of Heaven 62. The periods and stages of our regeneration, both the whole process and individual cycles within it, divide into six. And these six are called our days of creation. Step by step, we advance from being non-human to being somewhat human, though only a little, and then more and more so up to the sixth day. Now, Swedenborg called somebody who was in a state of mutual love truly human, as opposed to just just being a, a human-like person, when we become God's image. All the while, the Lord is constantly fighting on our behalf against evil and falsity, and through these battles, strengthens us in truth and goodness. The time of conflict is when the Lord is at work, and He does not rest until love takes the lead. Then the conflict ends. So there you go. There's your phrase, man. Love takes the lead. What's the point of all of it? It's not to sort people into good and evil. It's not to judge. It's not to make you feel bad about your life. It's to get it so that by the end of it, it's not that you're just in a club or something. It's that love takes the lead. That's the end goal of salvation. Love taking the lead. And so there are little ways in which in little bits of my life, little loves take the lead in me. And then over my whole life, divine providence is trying to move so that I end up with love first. Everything else can be there, but love is in charge. Love is the motivation. And that, that's the state of the Sabbath. That's the day of rest, is when love takes the lead. Life is still going on. Life is more amazing and electric than ever, but we're moving in the order we were created to be in. With that in mind, we have a couple of quotes about that Sabbath or day of rest. We'll just have some like Christmassy images behind them. Just take a little while, meditate on the thoughts as they come up, and just see how it feels to you, because we did it. You got through the whole show and made it to the period of rest. Here's the reward.
And something that's even cooler, I think, is that 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 as of self partnership remains. You know, you have to you have to take the initiative for this process to start. Um, just because we get to this day of rest when we have this clear connection with God and life is going great, it doesn't mean that that dynamic goes away. Still, we take initiative for things to happen. There's still this active partnership where God is working with us and and only working to the extent that we let him in, and it, it remains a relationship between two rather than just sort of, we're the same thing, you know, and that is actually where joy comes from. It's in being able to have others you relate to and to do them good. Even though there's all kinds of connectedness, there's also this, I can do something for you, you know, because of this this little difference that we have. If we were to boil down the message of this whole episode, if you, you know, if you didn't want to watch the whole thing too late you already watched it but here's what you could have done instead just go read divine providence 296 subsection 15 divine providence works in a thousand ways some most mysterious in each of us and its constant effort is to purify us remember right we're trying to get to be this if that's not inspiring sorry i keep showing it but to me i'm thinking like that is clean like that is ready to go do things that's a weird way to think about a pitcher of water This is because it is focused on the goal of saving us, and all that is required of us is that we set aside the evils in our outer self. The Lord takes care of the rest, if we ask. Again, if we ask. And the point, it's not, Swedenborg has a heading in one of his books that says, it's not as hard to lead a heaven-bound life as people think. It's just about wanting to do it and going for it. It's not about achieving perfection. It's just about, you know, taking the first little teeny step, maybe cleaning your house to get ready for a Christmas party or something like that. So there we go. We know we're headed towards this state of rest, and it's going to be an awesome way to to move forward. Hey, if you want to skip ahead and get to the state of rest right now, all you got to do is like and subscribe this video. Sorry, that was stupid, but I said it. You got to like and subscribe because that will help YouTube know that this is cool. Spread us out there. Hope you enjoyed our show. We're going to, as we promised, do a little bit of Q&A here. So, But first, we are a nonprofit. The reason we can make shows like this, spend that kind of money on that technology you know, that lets you see the spiritual world, is because of donations from people like you. So if you would take a minute, look at our philosophy and consider making a donation. All right, we'll do questions on the other side. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. I asked uh, if you would be back on the show soon. I'm, I'm glad you took me up on it. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Rose, since he's in the studio, is going to help me uh, hang out and answer some questions. So let's take a look, if you're willing, at the very first one. Uh, here it is. Uh, so right after we die, do we become angels or do we have to wait until Jesus returns? And this is from Antoinette. Do you want to take a stab at the initial answering of that? Sure. There's a couple of different pieces to that. Um, right after we die, we awaken in our spiritual bodies and we're in the spiritual world. Yep. The process of becoming an angel after that point is for some people very quick you know it's a couple hours they're very ready because they were already cooked all the way here Uh, for other people it might take quite a you know just like 10 or 15 years or whatever right uh but to move on depending on how similar their uh persona is to who they really are you kind of sort that out do you want to see the whole question and and the uh thank you uh the waiting until jesus returns right is uh, Swedenborg says that some people have taken that literally that Jesus will be in the physical clouds and everybody will see him all at once. There are some physical logistical problems with that concept. Yep. And that he shows, and I think you've done some other shows on this, that um, what that means is that um, 
he will be seen coming in the pages of Scripture, like in, in the inner meaning of Scripture is where he's going to appear, and also that he appears when it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the last trumpet and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That's actually each person's moment of death. That's when the Lord appears to them. Yeah, you know? so he's talking about like an individual process, the coming of Jesus to each person, just like we're right. talking here about salvation to each person. That there's This is kind of a, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but a thread in Swedenborg is that all this stuff that you think is big and out there is actually yeah, it's right. in here, and it's little, but it's powerful, and, and it, go, it applies to every person everywhere. All the time. That's right, and th and that's how it's possible for every eye to see him. You know, right, right, right. It's just distributed over over time, and so for, and it's a spiritual coming, spiritual right. rather than natural. That's another Swedenborgian yeah. theme. All right, thanks so much. Let's look at the next one. Zeke, are we better at what we have a passion for in the afterlife? Say, like playing an instrument, would we be a virtuoso? Okay, so you're asking if if we like something. In this world, for example, I I like basketball. I'm not very good at it. Uh, do I get better at it in the next world because I love it? What's going on there, man? Just just answer the question. The, yeah, it's, it's easy. well, I don't I, like. I feel like there's not an. We have to think about it because Swedenborg doesn't give you an, an easy out on that, right? Right. Is it, <clears throat> some of what he says is that um, when you go to the other world, you actually do things that correspond to what you did. That's right. So you're not literally taking a literal basketball and throwing it through a literal hoop. You're doing something that corresponds to mm -hmm. that, which I ought to know what that is off the top. Of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't think of you know something about goal oriented something or other. Yes. But, um, okay. Well, let's stay on that. Let's stay on that for a second. Um, because but, but that you would be better at. I believe. Right, you know. Right. You would have more passion. You'd have more insight around yes. it, and, and more energy for it, and everything. So because because whatever's at the root of basketball. Or whatever's at the root of playing an instrument, like like Zeke mentioned here, that exists in this this spiritual world yes. in its essence. That we we see sort of this weird rendering of it. Um, so there's something deeper in there. That, that's what you truly love. Now the question about do you are you good at? Because yeah, there's this thing where you know there's some people love to sing but they can't sing, <laughs> right? Um, and we're right. people too, you know. Um, so uh, does that resolved does anybody do in the spiritual world are there people who wish they could do something we swedenborg does talk about abilities increasing dramatically in the spiritual world people <clears throat> being able to speak eloquently who couldn't before that's right but i don't know the, the answer you know d does everything you like become something you're great at i don't know do you i think that passion would match your abilities better like you mm. know some people love to sing but they just don't have the physical organ for it or, yep. or you know kind of thing uh, that would be resolved i think you know what i mean like mm -hmm. your spiritual body would reflect the things that you care about and so you would be better at those things and uh, i it's fun to think about the virtuoso because when you think about practicing or doing something to eternity like yeah it must get pretty ridiculous you know how yeah. good you you get at that yeah. and how much love i think it would be so living too like what you're expressing wouldn't just be sort of external music but it would be something would be flowing through that yep. to people representation so of it is feeling. exciting to think about that endless yeah. development because swedenborg says that is definitely the case yeah all right there's so, definitely endless development whatever form that takes zeke i will come to your concert when we, that's when right. we get there all right we'll, we'll be there let's look at the next one this is kevin does swedenborg say anything about what happens to human souls right after the body dies in his visions Yes, indeed. And I believe you have done a show about that, right? The okay. Process of uh, the I would refer you to, uh, we have a show called What the World of, or called The World of Spirits. We also have a show called What This World of Spirits Is, which is not quite the same. But um, we also did a show called How Angels Take Care of Us mm. When We Die, mm. which describes that. Do you want to just give a quick explanation? Sure. So it's kind of amazing that Swedenborg reported hundreds of years before there was you know, that people coined the term near-death experience. Yes. He describes the process of dying. Mm -hmm. It's where the name of this YouTube channel comes from, is off the oh, left eye is one little, 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 one of the things that he describes is that something is yep. peeled off the left eye. We have eye a short and clip of that them. up on, like, the landing page of the channel you mm. guys can watch. Too. Right, yep. right, right. And he talks about before that how you get into this very deeply peaceful state 
mm-hmm. and evil spirits leave you and you're not troubled anymore and you go across in this beautiful you your thoughts are sort of anchored to the last positive thing that you were thinking about and you're thinking very deeply about that and you're in this very gentle presence of angels and then as they see that your face is reflecting the thoughts that they're sending oh, yeah. to you yep then they realize okay i think you're coming along and it's a very gentle wonderful welcome and then when you get to the point where it's more so that's the heart and then the cognitive part wakes up with it off the left eye and then any question you have is is answered right. and so forth and it's all quite an extraordinary sort of um uh, experience for people it seems yeah you you enter a period of what i would call full care where it mm. says the angels render to that person any service they desire and then right. actually that only ends when you decide I've had enough, right, and right. that may I've be soon, enough. that may be a while, depending. But but yeah, so it's good. And then people go back to a life that's more or less like the life they yes. had here at first, and then the story goes on from there. Yes, watch our show, The World of Spirits. Mm. Uh, that that will clue yeah, yeah. you in a bit to yeah. that. Or yeah, that, that's probably the good one. That that's the the continuation of the story. All right, let's do cool. two more questions, man. Since we're all on right. a roll here, sounds good. Uh, all right, so this is Lord Flacco. So if we haven't defeated our dirty, wrongful habits on our deathbed, will we not make it to heaven? Will those impurities block us? It's a great question. Like, hey, man, I tried, but I, you know, the the day before I died, I put a bag of chips in the in the, <laughs> the couch. Is it over? Now it's all over. The question, uh, to my mind, is not so much uh, whether you finished. But did you start by the time you yeah, died? That's right. That Swedenborg says that's the real question. Like, in other words, if you started by the time you died, if you went, if you yeah. devoted yourself to anything outside of yourself, or you ever laid aside something that you recognized was evil, right. or you started to work on yourself in some way like that, that process can be continued yeah. after death. Yeah. If in- you've really spent every waking breath, you know, never, never doing why, that. Why do you look at me when you say the, that? The, the, the picture. <laughs> no, sorry. It was just the, the picture. I was actually looking at that oh, uh, the dirty jar book. full of yeah. uh, wood chips. Um, 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 then, you know, if you've never taken a single wood chip yeah. out, uh, uh, that is more of a hazard. Yeah. But uh, it's it's a very merciful process. So you don't have to have completely defeated that stuff. Yeah. You know, you still may have baggage and they have ways of dealing with that in the other world that are very, yeah. very helpful and intense and stuff. It's a, yeah, I think I've said this on this show before, but it almost seems like results don't matter, intentions matter, right? Yes. Th- that, that uh, no, it do- so it doesn't matter. If you haven't kicked the habits by the time, that will not block you from heaven permanently, right? That if you right. if you've... I would like to. The only way you're going to not go to heaven is if you don't want to go to heaven. Right, right. And if there's no evidence in your film anywhere and anything that you've felt, anything that you thought or anything that you did, right. that you ever actually wanted to resist that. You actually totally, totally love it. Yeah. And you weren't fighting it at all. You know, that might stick around. You know, that's going to be hard to, right. to get rid of. But if people can see that you despaired of this, you tried to fight it here, and then it came back yeah. over there, and you're in this long struggle or something like that, that's you, you'll, that's be, you'll be fine. You that, know, as yeah. far as I, if I'm reading, if I have the book the right way up when I read it, that's I think right. that's what I was right. talking about. Okay, very good. All right, let's do one more. Jacob, now do other people's demons, or whatever you call them, affect you also? Do they mm. say the same things to you or have a different perception for you wow that's a great question that's a good one oh that's a good thing there's a certain playbook i think that's very familiar (laughs) you know what i mean like there's certain sorts of things but i i believe i don't know if sweden works i think he does speak to this but i i think everybody has their own people talk about your your demons or something you know what i mean i think they're different from okay. one person to another, like there are certain things you you must know friends or or people in your life who, you know, they feel terribly distressed. Like when they see someone succeed, then they feel like they've done nothing with their life or something. Yes, and you don't get hooked by that, but it's something else that hooks you. That's right. You know what I mean. And we all have yep. our our little things, or, you know. And so I think we've got kind of different, just like we have a different microbiome or something. You know, like yeah. everybody has their their own sort of set of spiritual yeah influences. Well, that's a, and it's a complex world that Swedenborg describes in terms of the influence of heaven and hell. Because he talks about at times, we all have two 
angels and two devils right. with us as our individuals. However, then he talks about uh, all kinds of spirits that were around him all the time, influencing him in different ways. He talks about sort of roving evil spirits that came up to mess with him. He talks about spirits manipulating a bunch of other spirits and stuff. So mm-hmm. there's probably in that web there room for, you know, somehow somebody else's some or some other evil spirits can know what's up with you and try to get you. Or do do you ever hear? other people's demons coming out of their mouth at you or, or do they talk to yours mm, yeah, and know what would right. get you i think there's there's like you know if you if you just like if you were able to rip open the world as it is here and look at all what's all the shady stuff going on in the world like at every like conspiracy that's true every um criminal ring that's going on there's a lot of messed up stuff i imagine it's the same thing spiritually there's got to right. be that there's some kind of hell that can um get two people to turn against each other and then it uh, from that it does that there's got to be some more layers of complexity but yet there's also this sort of what you were mentioning before this like we do have our own little um yeah our own little spiritual germs that affect us in a particular way it's a great example that some people really struggle with something that other people it's like why does that even bother you you know so and and i am uh, thinking back on that image of the that figure of light that's stretching out yeah. behind the whole thing and that passage that said that we read tonight that said that it, the angels are standing by so that uh, it doesn't go on beyond, like, so that you're not, they prevent you from being drowned by it. That's like, right. it's not supposed yeah. to just crush you. It feels like you're crushing, you're being crushed. You yeah. Know? But, uh, but you it's not really destroying your, your spirit. It's actually benefiting you. Mm-hmm. And so if someone else's... You know, if someone has a level three evil spirit and you've only got a level two, oh, yeah. they won't be able to do all their level three, you know, yeah. magic on you because, uh, you know, you, you're protect, you're not ready for that yet or, what, or yeah. whatever. You know, okay. You're okay. Yep. So there, there's some sort of a limit to it. But um, I think it's a lot more complex than, than so, we realize. And that would yeah. be funny, like, oh, I picked up your evil spirit. You know? Yeah. So I feel like that's a great place to leave it because, like, who would ever thought people would want to watch us? speculate on this kind of stuff um I, it's just i all the time i'm so glad that there's the, you guys out there that community that's, that's right. interested in this kind of stuff in general and what did swedenborg say and in trying to make life better um so thank you so much for having us thanks for coming on the show mm, hope to have you fun. again on soon again uh and next week hey this is the last show of 2016 as i said next week is christmas break we won't be doing a show then however we will we have an episode you might want to watch. Watch out, your head might get knocked off by this thing. Oh, here you go. We did a show <laughs> called Why Jesus Was Born, which is pretty appropriate for Christmas. This is Swedenborg's take on it. Check that one out if you need something on Monday night. We will see you in the new year uh, with a, a questions panel show. So what's sort of what we did here, but with more friendly faces and more questions, and we'll really dig into that to start the new year. Thanks so much, everyone, for hanging out. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.